And what Baker Broadfoot is, these two guys were experts. They went all over the South. This is really more focused for the Mississippi Alluvial Valley. Uh, may not technically apply in East Texas, but it's the best tool we've got. But they went all over the place. They dug a lot of holes and they put together an expert system. And basically you dig a soil pit and you take a multiple choice test. That's all this is. And you take a multiple choice test for one of these species listed here on the right that you're interested in. That multiple choice test addresses the physical condition of the soil, the available moisture in the soil, the nutrient availability in the soil and the aeration. Those are the soil properties they thought tied into tree growth the most. And so here's some students from Field Station from about, oh, that's probably 2011. Uh, so Ron DeRoche digging a hole, Seth assisting here, um, and then Jared here, seeing if it had much clay in it, seeing if it'll ribbon out. Uh, but then you, you look at this multiple choice test and you start going through here. And for each row, you got three choices. You pick the one you think is right based on your soil pit. And then what we notice, you will see this bracketed number six, four, negative two. So you see this bracketed number here. This superscript two does not mean you square the six. That doesn't mean 36. That means you look at a footnote if you're interested. But what you do is we add these bracketed numbers up. We add six, we add three, we add six, we add six, we add one. And what you're doing is you're adding feet to an estimate of site index. That's all you're doing. So you can go ahead and, and look at this. And so this is an example for cherry bark oak up here. But if you had an undisturbed near virgin forest, that adds eight feet to site index for cherry bark oak. Whereas if you had an area that was an intense cultivation and it's been cultivated for more than 20 years or open or bare, you're expecting cherry bark oak to grow seven fewer feet in height over a 50 year rotation. You just took seven feet off site index. It's only adding one foot to site index. So Baker Broadfoot's a great tool because you can already look at it and it tells you a ton about the silvics of these species. So it tells you cherry bark oak does not like compaction. That'll take two foot off site index. It really likes uncompacted, porous, friable, low bulk density soils. That'll add six feet to site index. So there's a ton of information about the silvics of these species in this Baker Broadfoot tool. That was one page. I think cherry bark oak has three, maybe four pages there. You add them all up and those numbers are an SQR. They're not calling it a site index because you didn't estimate a tree height and you didn't get an age on a tree because that species wasn't on that site. That's where you're gonna use this tool. You've got an old field, you've got a cut over pine site. You wanna know how cherry bark oak does there, but there are no cherry bark oaks. You could even use this in a hardwood stand you're looking at regenerating where maybe you think cherry bark oak was high graded out. And so it's not there now, but that, that doesn't mean it wasn't a cherry bark oak site, right? Uh, it may have just been past mismanagement uh, based on the land use history. So uh, here's some, some breakouts from there. Uh, for some reason, they put cottonwood on a 30-year site index. I've never seen a 30-year site index outside of this context. 25 years would be more typical. Everything else is on a 50-year site index. But basically, you do Baker Broadfoot, and here are your recommendations. So cherry bark oak is in this middle row. If you get a site index estimate less than 70 feet, you should be telling a landowner, this is not a great site for cherry bark oak. We're not expecting it to grow well. You know, you, you know the landowner may want it, but it's likely to fail. It's that bar we just looked at a minute ago over here. This is what you're going to be doing to the landowner over here on the left. You're going to be telling them, yeah, cherry bark oak, great. You're going to plant it. It's all going to die. It's going to get out competed. Uh, so that, that's what you use Baker Broadfoot for. Uh, so it's a pretty powerful tool. And when, when you get good with it and you've had soils, you understand everything that's in it, from a soil standpoint, it'll get you within a few feet of an actual site index. It's a pretty accurate tool. The first thing you'll need to do on site to implement Baker Broadfoot is to just look around and get a feel for your site. Uh, you wanna look at the composition. Here we see some pines, some oaks, mostly a hardwood stand, but with some pine component. You gotta get a sense for the landscape. As we look around here, we're noticing a big open boggy area and another stream. We're kind of right between them. You wanna notice the land form. We're definitely down here in a depression on the landscape. It's a wet site. As we go to dig this hole, I would anticipate we're gonna hit some water, but we'll see. You also wanna get a sense for the past land use history. It certainly looks like there was logging in here at some point. This isn't an old growth forest, but some of these trees are old. This has been a forest for quite some time.
All right, folks, so we've dug our soil pit, uh, and as you can see, we didn't go very deep. Um, this sharpshooter shovel is about 16 inches long. Would have been fun to dig a little deeper. Uh, the challenge here was a combination of how wet this site is. So you can see this hole, just a few minutes after finishing, it is already filling up with water. So we have clear indication that the water table is pretty high right now. And that's really no surprise in this particular spot. Um, we're standing between a couple creeks. Um, one of the creeks is kind of wide here, uh, making sort of a small wetland. And so we would expect the water table to be high. Um, even with a high water table, sometimes you can dig into it a little bit. But the real challenge here is that we had very, very sandy soil textures. We'll see again in a moment. So it just kind of turned into a soup. We weren't pulling anything out uh, useful anymore. And so how I've got this soil laid out you can see kind of how I dug it. So here's the litter layer on top. We get into the A horizon, and then we go into lower layers. You kind of have to ignore some of this. Uh, it got mixed a little as I was digging it out. I didn't do the neatest job here. We're gonna try the ribbon test here. So I've got a nice handful of soil. Um, you work it. I would add water to this if it was dry, but this is already really wet. And honestly, I don't even need to do this. I can just see by feeling it and everything. As I try to ribbon it out between my index finger and my thumb, this isn't ribboning at all. If it had more than 43% clay, it would form about a two inch long ribbon. Um, if it had less than 17, or between 17 and 43% clay, it'd form about a one inch ribbon. But this is forming no ribbon. I can feel it in my hand, and you can probably see it sticking to my hand there. This is very sandy in texture. So it's very clear that our texture here is sandy. Here's another important feature to notice down here uh, where I'm pointing. Um, that's what's called glaying. You'll notice how we go from brightly colored soils here. There's iron and other minerals in there that are interacting with oxygen, and they're oxidizing. That gives them bright colors. But then we get down here where it's wetter, and we notice it's grayer. And this was so soupy when I pulled it up, it mixed some. You're seeing some lighter colors in there as well. Um, but you see the grays. That's where there's no oxygen to react with the iron and other minerals, and so it's reduced. And so the gray color, it's technically called glaying, G-L-E-Y-I-N-G. And with glaying, it's a sign you've got a high water table. Of course, we can see how wet this is. We don't need to even, you know, use the color to tell that there's moisture here, because again, our hole filled with water. Uh, this was an easy one. But if this was drier, if I was doing this in July or August, and it was drier over here, I might need that as a clue that it got wet uh, in the winter. Okay, so let's start working our Baker Broadfoot tables. Remember we have the four tables uh, where they focus on uh, soil site condition, they focus on um, physical condition first, then moisture availability, uh, and then we have two more tables that are all on the same page, um, nutrient availability and aeration. Now on this particular site, I'm gonna go ahead and use water oak. Um, I'm doing that for a reason. Um, I've already looked up where we are here on Web Soil Survey, and so I know that I can get an estimate of site index for water oak on this site from Web Soil Survey. I just looked to see if I could get the estimate. I haven't looked up the estimate yet. I'll, I'll double check that uh, after I do this so I don't end up biased. So let's start on the physical condition table. You see it on your screen right now. And so to work this, I'm going to start with this first row. This is just a multiple choice test. I'm going to look at soil depth and presence of artificial or inherent pan. And so I have three columns, and you'll see those columns at the top are labeled best, medium, and poor. And so looking at best, you see deep soil greater than four feet without a pan, and there's a bracketed six there with a superscript two. Again, I mentioned this already, but the superscript two just is a footnote. Go look at the footnote if you want. That doesn't mean we're squaring this. It's not 36. And so we can see I only dug a hole about 16 inches here. This was a very sandy textured soil. It's hard to get a pan layer in a sandy textured soil. Looking around here, there's big trees on this site. There is absolutely no indication to me there should be any sort of pan layer on here. Um, and the, you know, no plow pan, anything of the sort. Um, the birds are happy, the trees are happy. So I'm gonna go with deep soil, greater than four feet without a pan, okay? Next, texture in the rooting zone. Well, you saw me try to ribbon that out. You can look at this, and this is a sandy soil. 
So I'm going to circle this middle one, coarse textured sandy. Okay, compaction in the surface foot. Um, so that hole dug extremely easily. Uh, sands can have higher bulk density just because, you know, they're basically tiny rocks. Um, so, you, you know, you could reasonably get a sand bulk density up to like 1.6. Sands are harder to compact at a higher bulk density than clays would be. They're using 1.4 here because generally over 1.4 you're compacted. It really dramatically reduces root growth. Ideally for a forest soil, you'd like 0.9. And to tell you the truth here, bulk density, you, if you actually want to get a good estimate of this, you need to, you know, use a slide hammer, collars, dry them down in the lab. It's a long procedure. Most people for Baker Broadfoot aren't using that. This is an expert system. Let's work with the art of silviculture here. So that hole was real easy to dug. The soil was loose. Um, it says friable there. That just means the soil breaks apart into little pieces easily. So I'm going to circle no compaction. Okay, uh, next up I need to look at it. Is it granular? Well, sand is granular, that's an easy one. I'm circling six again. Prismatic blocky would be clay or textures where there are little peds that hold together. We don't have that. Massive if clay, we don't have that. Okay, now they use the word virgin here, undisturbed near virgin. I know this stand has been harvested before. I know I'm not in an old growth forest here, but my other options are cultivated less than 20 years or with open grass cover an intense cultivation, and that certainly doesn't describe what I've got here. I've got trees that are large enough in this stand, I can't imagine there's been any significant activity in here for at least 50 years. So again, I'm going undisturbed near virgin forest cover. And so that is table eight here for water oak, and so we've knocked out table eight, and it's looking good for water oak right now, right? We're so circling best in terms of our physical condition of the soil for most of these variables. Okay, next up we are looking at our moisture availability during the growing season. Okay, this is important. This is during the growing season. I'm standing here doing this on May 20th, 2020. And so technically it's still spring here. It's starting to feel a little more like summer. Um, but really, I know this site is going to dry down more over the coming months. Um, unless we get a hurricane, let's keep our fingers crossed that doesn't happen. And so I know I hit moisture here. It's, it's at about one foot. Uh, right now, but I know I'm early in the growing season. And so again, let's use the art of silviculture. And what I'm looking at for water table depth here most likely is going to be this middle category. Most of the year during the growing season, I think I would hit it between one and two feet. Okay, so we saw on the previous table, it was asking me, you know, is this undisturbed? Is there a plow pan? And now here it goes and it asks about pans again. This tool is going to be repetitive, and the stuff it repeats, that's the stuff you really want to get right, because that'll swing fight it, site index by quite a lot. And so again, I know there's no pan layer here. Topographic position, uh, floodplain or stream bottom, we're right here on a stream bottom. Okay, let's look around the site. So I already looked around the site to look at the forest cover, but let's look around the site here again. And this time, let's do it to look at our topography. And what I'm clearly seeing here is that I am in a concave depression, a pocket, or a trough. It's not level and flat, and I'm not on a ridge or mound. So I'm circling that on the best. And you can see this is looking like it's shaping up to be a good water oak site. We're still circling best on most things. We haven't circled poor on anything yet. Okay, and so now we get down to structure in the rooting zone. And again, we saw something similar to this, but this one's worded a little bit different. Granular, yes, we have that. Structureless, massive. If silty, loamy, or clay, stratified. But let's look over at poor. Structureless, okay, so we're seeing that again. Single grained if sandy. Well, we kind of have single grain sand here. You saw how that came apart. So we have one thing in the poor condition, but look at what it did. It only, you know, that gave us three feet to our site index versus five. It only made a two foot difference. So not a big difference there. Texture in the rooting zone, sandy. So we're getting some moisture availability characteristics that are less than ideal here. Flooding. Well, I'm here in the spring, um, and I can see flooding right next to me, winter through spring. Past use and present cover, it's asking me again, same answer again. All right, so we've knocked out the moisture availability table. Done. Okay, now we're on to factor number three, nutrient availability. And so as I look at this, 
this geological source, this doesn't really fit. Remember, we're on the West Gulf here. This thing was really designed for the lower Mississippi alluvial valley. We're kind of out of place for it. Um, we don't have the major river bottom soils like they would have on the Mississippi River. We don't have lurse, windblown silts like you get in Vicksburg, Mississippi. We don't have blacklands right here in this spot in the East Texas Piney Woods. I'm going to go with mixed coastal plain or other, and you can see this isn't making a huge difference in my estimate, just a foot. Past land use, starting to look familiar, huh, folks? So we're still going undisturbed or near virgin. Organic matter in the A horizon. Let's look at our A horizon right here. See that? You're kind of just using a guesstimate based on how dark it looks. That kind of looks moderate to me, so I'm going to circle 1 to 2% right here in the middle. Depth of topsoil, A horizon. Greater than six inches or no profile development. Well, I can tell you right here, because I happen to look up this soil order before coming out and digging the pit, that we have an inceptisol, and we can see that. We're starting to get some color development down here, a cambic horizon. And with a cambic horizon, that's a B sub W horizon, we know we don't have an entosol, we know we have an inceptisol. So we do have some profile development. We can see our A horizon up here, you know, it's going to be about four inches or so. So I'm going to circle three to six inches there. Soil age. Is it an entosol? No, it's an inceptosol because I'm starting to develop that profile. So I'm going to circle one here in the middle. Well, I'm not measuring pH in the rooting zone here. Um, but, you know, best guess looking at the species. I've got some pines out here. That's going to drive your acidity down a little bit. So I'm just taking a wild guess here. And I'm guessing the pH here would be in the low fives. So I'm going to circle uh, best right here. It, it could easily be in this middle category where it's somewhere between 5.6 and 7.5. I doubt it's in the fours, but ideally you would measure that. I, d I don't have any testing strips or anything handy today. Okay, uh, our final table here now is aeration. And so we're seeing stuff that's pretty repetitive now. Uh, single grain diff sandy, we've already been here and done that. There it is again. Remember that hurt us before under another category, but here under aeration it helps us. Well, swampiness. Am I wet in the winter only? Eh, not really. I can tell I'm here in May. So wet January to July seems reasonable. This is going to dry out in the summer. Modeling. None to 18 inches depth. Well, I only dug to 16 inches right about here, and I'm starting to get some of that glaying that we discussed. Uh, but look in the top 8 inches about here. There's no modeling there. There's no gray, no glaying. So I'm going to circle this middle one here. And then finally, soil color in the rooting zone. There's our woodpecker again. Okay, yellow and brownish gray seems pretty reasonable. Okay, I'm not seeing a whole lot of reds. There's some subtle reds in there. And again, this is kind of subjective, but you can see it's only making a couple feet of site index difference. And there we go. We've completed our table. So now we just need to add it all up. Well, we've completed all the tables, so you can see here I have a spreadsheet. So what I've done here is I've gone through and the bracketed number in every item we circled across all four of those tables, I've entered it in the spreadsheet, and then you can see the cell with the larger text. I added all those numbers up, and what that 88 is telling us is that our site index at 50 feet for water oak, we would expect the trees to be 88 feet tall. So how do you ask did we do? Well, looking at the soil survey after the fact, uh, it had 89 feet for our soil series. So we're within one foot of what the soil survey says. Uh, there weren't any water oaks actually out there that I could core, which is the whole point of this tool. Now I know that based on Baker Broadfoot, uh, 88 feet is more than the 70 feet minimum that they recommend for water oak. So if I wanted to open that stand up enough that I could... Um, let enough light on the forest floor and plant some water oaks, I, I, my best guess is they would survive. They would be very productive. They would be 88 feet tall at 50 years. So that's how you use Baker Broadfoot.